like those on. It's probably a good thing. Ooh, we're filling up out there. I'm going to keep playing, huh? Huh? Really? Oh, yeah, well, this is maybe not quite ready yet. <laughs> Good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. I saw Jesse back there with his new haircut all spiked up. I didn't recognize him. I thought we had a visitor. You know what? I ask you to fill out the register and pass it back so we have that record for the week. Um, things coming up this week. Tuesday evening is youth Bible study. Wednesday evening is adult Bible study. And a couple of things coming up in the future on December 12th is Women's Circle. And I think Charlene's got it all planned out, so you ladies plan on coming because it sounds like a good evening. And the next night, we want you all to come back because Lee has procrastinated just about as far as he can. And we need to have a couple of quarters worth of business meetings. So come on December 13th uh, for a quarterly about a half a year church business meeting. Uh, birthdays, anniversaries this week. Mary Driscoll had one last week. Since we didn't meet last week, we didn't get a chance to uh, celebrate birthdays. Mark and Lisa have a, uh, an anniversary last week. Um, they weren't going to be here, so Mark was sure to tell me the week before, but I can't remember. Mark, how many years? 
30, 30, 30. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Karen Ferry had a birthday on uh, Friday. Shirley Stout has a birthday tomorrow. And Kathy Mock has one on the 5th. So wish everybody happy birthday this week. Let's uh, go to a time of worship and let's turn in our bulletin to the call to worship and let's read that together. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give them all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. And look at that again. Those songs go right along. Well, you all came back. Good. Last week, you know, we had 10 inches of snow, nine and a half, and it just made things, when you get to be my age, dangerous to get out. So, well, no, it's not too bad. But it, uh, it, was, it was good. It was a nice snow. But we needed it for the wheat that lay on there, so everybody's happy now again. So, Well, if you can still sing, we are going to pick up uh, where we left off a couple weeks ago and continue <laughs> With blessed be the name that is in your hymnal on 103, hymn number 103, or on the wall. So stand with me and sing, blessed be the name. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just uh, come before you to bless your name for, to, for the power that you give us, for the freedom that you give us, for the love that you give us, and for your grace, Lord. We just thank you for that. We thank you for everyone that's here this morning, that we can fellowship together and, and hear your word and, and just lift each other up, Lord. Bless each one of us richly as we go about today and, and this coming week. We pray this in the name of him who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is a kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated.
We'll sing two more. You just remain seated. We'll sing 161 first in your hymnal and then 88. We'll sing both those back to back there. it's great to to just be reminded of it 
So this is a symbolism of the Advent wreath. The Advent wreath is a circular, and since it has no beginning or no end, it reminds us of God's never-ending love for us. It's made of evergreens, which are a sign of life in an otherwise lifeless winter. They remind us of the eternal life that we have in Jesus. There are five candles that are lit in succession, one more each week as we count the Sundays in Advent, waiting for Christ's birth. As we anticipate the coming of Christmas Day, we are reminded of those who waited thousands of years for the Messiah. On Christmas Day, the fifth candle, the Christ candle, is lit. Jesus is the light of the world that shines bright in the spiritual darkness. Three of the candles are purple, the traditional color of royalty. The one pink candle is lit on the third Sunday to represent joy. It suggests the Rose of Sharon. The Christ candle is always white and placed in the center of the wreath. We listen each week to what that day's candle represents, but the progressive lighting of the candles demonstrates the increasing light as Christ's kingdom grows in the world. Each week, a different group of persons will come forward to read the light, read and light the candles. This shows how we are part of a family of many members while we are each unique individuals. Jerry, Mary. <coughs> Today's candle represents hope. We have hope because of the coming of Jesus, the Christ. Listen as we read a prophecy written about Jesus 700 years before he was born. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was a descendant of Jesse. This is Isaiah 11, 110 in the New Living Transla Translation. Then one will come from the family of Jesse. A branch will grow out of his roots, and the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of wise words and strength, the spirit of much learning and the fear of the Lord. He will be glad in the fear of the Lord, he will not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but he will judge the poor in a right and good way. He will be fair in what he decides for the people of the earth who have much trouble. He will punish the earth with his powerful mouth and kill the sinful with the breath of his lips. He will wear a belt of what is right and good and faithful around his body. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the baby goat. The calf and the young lion and the young fat animal will lie down together. And a little boy will lead them. The cow and the bear will eat side by side and their young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, and another child will put his hand in the hole of a snake whose bite is poison. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be as full of much learning from the Lord as the seas are full of water. Well, this is too complicated for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always there for you, Jerry. Okay. Uh oh, this is, who knows if this is going to be. Well, I was pushing this the wrong way.
Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, <clears throat> and come that your protection, we, by your protection, we may be rescued from the penalty of our sins. And be a redeemer to us, to deliver us, who lives and reigns with God the Father in the un unity of the Holy Spirit forever, uh, one God, world without end. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Do you like the atmosphere in here today? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's nice we have the dimmer control for the lights, too. It was a little bit too dark. I thought you might all just go to sleep without any lights on <laughs> through the whole service. Um, but, yeah, so we can control that and continue the mood. It looks beautiful. Um, thank you, Jerry and Mary, for coming up and, and doing our first Advent candle for us. You did a great job. I want to give a shout out to all those who came yesterday to decorate. There were 20 as far as I recollect, correct me if I miss anybody, but Charlene, Greg, Luella, Mary Ann, Marie, Cinnamon and Sydney, Lee and Shirley, Gary and Sherry, Jennifer and Vern, Kathy, Rick and Melissa, Roz and Jesse, and Jill and I were here decorating. And there were other people who would like to have come, but they couldn't for one reason or another. So we appreciate, you know, your willingness to come in the spirit, too. But the 20 got the job done. Even, even the kids helped some. <laughs> so thank you very much, folks, for coming and doing that. Well, it's time for us to go to the Lord in prayer. Um, let's bow our heads as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this season, for the hope that we have of eternal life and for heaven as Mary read that passage from Isaiah about how the lion will lay down with the lamb and the child will play with the dangerous animals and reach down into the snake's den and not be bitten how there will be peace and harmony and love and joy in that kingdom we're looking forward to it Lord thank you for helping us in this life to serve you and to be encouraged and strengthened by you for whatever we may be facing. This week ahead, this week behind, this time that we are in, it is a time of challenge. But Lord, you have said you will be with us when we are in trouble, when we call out to you. And so we do call out to you, Lord. We call out that you would help us each one, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, whatever we're going through. Give us peace. Give us the assurance of your presence. And give us success. In Christ's name, we pray this. We thank you for it. Lord, we also want to remember our Christian brothers and sisters suffering in the Darfur area of Sudan, where there's so much persecution going on these days. The Christians are suffering greatly. Uh, the tribesmen around there are of a different religion, and they are pushing against the Christians, trying to wipe them out, coming in and slaughtering in their villages. We pray for angels to be about them and protecting them, Lord. And may these who come against them be frightened at the sight of them, the fiery guardians. We pray for their spirits, that they would be encouraged, and that they would continue to stand strong for you. Lord, speaking of the world and that, we just sent off a bunch of Operation Christmas Child boxes a couple or last week week or two weeks ago, we ask that you would bless those boxes and who they're going to. Whatever little child will be receiving one of those boxes this year, we pray that it would be a blessing to them, that it would bring them joy and happiness, but that it would especially draw them close to you. We thank you for the ministry that Samaritan purse, Samaritan's Purse is doing in this way in reaching so many people. We also want to thank you for Maya Grace Peachy, Mark Unruh's great granddaughter, born on Thanksgiving Day, very young, 27 weeks along, very small, and yet, Lord, she's thriving. We thank you for it. Continue to bless her and bless her parents. 
We pray for Matt, Paula's daughter's brother-in-law, who has been in ICU for over a week now. And Lord, he's turned for the better. He's gotten stabilized. We pray that he would continue to mend and that you would work in him, in his body and in his mind and in his spirit. Thank you for Mike being here with us today. Help him to continue to recover from his fall and to get back on his feet in every way, physically and, and just in his life, what's ahead of him. Continue to bless him. Be with Roger Stout, George's brother, and his extremely high heartbeat problems um, and things needing to be done about it. Encourage him. And Janice, Chris's friend, with her new tumor, and she was looking like she was doing well in her cancer battle, but it seems to have taken a turn for the worse. Strengthen her, Lord. And Jasper, Cinnamon's brother, may he be encouraged and filled with joy and peace and your guidance in his life. And Sue Christensen and her upcoming hip replacement, be with her in the meantime, and may the surgery go well. And Lisa, as she continues to serve in the Omega House in Bueller, bless her and keep her. Be with the Omega Project and all those lives that they are touching. We pray your protection around all of them who are in leadership and in service positions and all of the people who are participating in the program. We pray for Vern that you would strengthen him as he endures so much back pain these days and other pains too in his knees and, and as he fights the cancer. Be with him and give him victory, Lord. And, and Jennifer too as she stands by him. And Gloria McMurray, give her strength. Bless her, Lord, we pray. And Jerry, as she continues to recover from the surgery, may she heal well. And Karen and her Special request, watch over her. And Shanna, this friend of Diana Larson, thank you that her cancer treatments are going well. And Jerry, Chris's sister, and her struggles with uh, kidneys and other things in her life and her body. And Lord, we lift before you now our unspoken requests. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing and answering. For it is in your name we pray. Amen. We will sing one more now here, uh, The Love of God, in your hymnal. It's in page 67, so remain seated. Say, say. 
Well, it's time to worship the Lord in giving, and the passage for today is uh, from 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 12 through 14. And this is David's prayer after a big building program that they had just had, fundraiser. He had all, pe- all kinds of people bringing in offerings and that, and he's offering them to God, and these are the words that he prays. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. Ushers, would you come forward, please? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for all that you have given to us. We work hard, but in truth, the blessings, the bounty comes from your hand. And acknowledging that and out of gratitude to you, we return a portion for the building up of your kingdom. Please bless it, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. stand. And you may be seated. And I'm sorry. No. Sorry. <laughs> We've got a really, really full program. So <laughs> the next week, got a really good one. <laughs> um, but the message today, we're not going to pass on that. Uh, the message today is based on two passages. They're both from the, uh, the lectionary, which is a collection of scripture texts that you can follow through the whole year. And each Sunday has a special text that goes with it. And so the first Sunday of Advent um, are, is the one that we're reading from today. So that is Isaiah 64, verses 1 through 9, and Mark 13, verses 24 through 27. And... Uh, If you're using the Pew Bible, that's great. You may want to keep it open because I'll be referring to those texts quite a bit. I'll start out with the Isaiah one and then move on to Mark. You may want to keep it open and check what I'm saying. But would you stand as we read together? I'll read Isaiah 64, 1 through 9. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. 
as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil. Come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continued to sin against them, you were angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the, like the wind, our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. Oh, look on us, we pray, for we are all your people. And then the passage from Mark chapter 13, verses 24 through 27. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. You may be seated. Well, I titled today's message, All the World in Five Acts. Um, I could have titled it, Our Hope in the Coming King, which would have been more in keeping with the Advent candle theme for this week, and also the overall theme of what it is saying. But there are five stages or acts that we see in what has happened on earth since the beginning of time. When we say the word hope, understand that we don't mean I hope the Kansas City Chiefs go to the Super Bowl and win this year. We don't know if that's going to happen or not. Um, <laughs> but when we say hope in the biblical Christian sense, it means something that we're really looking forward to that we are certain will happen. We just don't know when. We're looking forward to heaven. We have a hope in heaven. We're looking forward to it. We know we will be there if we are in Christ, but we just don't know when. So we have that hope, that feeling of, of anticipation. Now we look back at the birth of Jesus with gratefulness and faith for what he has done. But our hope is looking forward to his next coming, the second coming of Christ. And that will be a very different thing from his first coming. So, today we'll talk about the five acts in all the world. The first act <clears throat> is when God created the world, and it was good. The second act is humans rebelling against God and bringing suffering and judgment on themselves and on all. The third act was when Jesus came as a humble servant to bring in the new kingdom age. The fourth act is where we're at now. Still, humans rebel against God, and suffering and judgment are on all. And then the fifth act will be when Jesus comes again in a day of terror and triumph, of separation and salvation. I need to unpack that a little bit, I think. So act one, in Genesis, we have the account of God creating the world. And it says there, when it came to creating human beings... The first man and woman, Adam and Eve, God said, let us create them in our image. This is God, the Trinity here, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all present at the creation of the world. And those human beings were created to live forever 
in joy before God, fellowshipping with him, willingly and freely worshiping him. But then, quickly, came Act 2, where the humans rebelled against God and suffered the consequences. Namely, the worst consequence of all was being removed from the garden, being removed from the direct presence of God. Before they rebelled, they talked with God face to face, but after their rebelling, they could not. They broke the fellowship. They entered into the world of pain and suffering. Even bringing new children into the world is a time of pain. And the work which God gave to man and woman to do at the beginning, which was supposed to be something that satisfied them and gave them joy and accomplishment, turned into something that was a struggle to survive by sweat and tears. And yes, death came to all humans. Even though humans rebelled against God, he still seeks those who will seek him. Uh, Clayton, I meant to tell you this before the service. Can you put that Isaiah passage back up on the wall for us? You might have to flip through a few. There we go. Uh, I want to look at verses 4 and 5. They're perfect. Um, the last part of Isaiah, verse, 60, or, yeah, verse 4 and verse 5 says, No eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. So this is saying, even during that time before Christ, that God acts on behalf of those who wait for him, who sought after him. God comes to the aid of those who tried to do right, who remembered his ways. There were some who did follow that way, follow God in that way. Enoch, who was so close to God, he was just taken. The Bible says he didn't die, he just was taken. And Noah, who God saved when he had the great flood on all the earth. And there were some others, but by and large, the population lived in rejection of God. Then Isaiah 64, 5b says, they sinned against God's ways. How can we then be said, the bottom line there? Where, where is it? Is it there? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Can't see it. Uh, but it's there. All of us have become like one who is unclean. All our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Many people think they don't need to depend on Jesus in order to be right with God. They think, well, I've done some bad things, but I'm doing more good things. So overall, the balance is on the good side and God is going to accept me. But it says, no, even the righteous acts are filthy rags. Verse 6, we see that. Even the righteous acts are like filthy rags. It's like being invited to someone's house for a meal. And they're a good cook. And the food is really good. But as soon as you come into the house, you see that it's filthy. And it smells like garbage. And you sit down at the table and your elbows stick and there's gunk all over the table. And bugs crawling in that. And, you know, no matter how good that meal is, you're not going to enjoy it. You probably won't even be able to bring yourself to eat it, even if it was cooked by a top chef. By a top chef. No, you wouldn't be able to stomach it. That is what it is like when we try to do good from our unrighteous condition to try and win favor with God. First, Christ has to come and clean house. He has to take away our sins and clean us up spiritually on the inside. And then we can invite him. Result of all of this in verse 6, it says, We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. People shrivel up like a dead leaf and blow away. They don't last. The wind comes and sweeps them away. They should call on God, and he will save them. But verse 7 says, No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you. It was a pretty bad condition that we were in, humanity was in. But then came Act 3. God makes his next big move after creation. He comes as a human being, as the baby Jesus. 
He doesn't come as a conquering king to force everybody to worship him and to serve him. He came as a baby, born to a young mother, maybe 13, 14, 15 years old, with an earthly father, Joseph, to raise him as their own child. He came in weakness and humility. He came and he conquered by his weakness. It wasn't a political, military conquering. It was a spiritual conquering. He allowed people to reject him. They had been doing that from the very first when Adam and Eve rebelled against him. And the final rejection was putting him to a cruel death on the cross. And the people then thought they had won. It's like, yeah, we've gotten rid of that troublemaker. He's not going to cause problems with us anymore. But instead of stopping his kingdom, they only empowered it because this was part of God's plan that he would be a sacrifice. And three days later, he came back to life. Having finished his mission on earth, he ascended back to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit to work among us to help us do things that are pleasing to God. When we are in Christ and the Holy Spirit is in us, we can do things that are pleasing to him. Okay, we come to Act 4. We started in Act 1 with the perfect world where people were worshiping God and in fellowship with him. Then Act 2 was how the people rebelled and the world became a spiritual battlefield and a place of misery. And then Act 3, Jesus came to set up his kingdom through his own death. Now Act 4, he ushered in Act 4 by his death. It's the time when individuals can willingly and freely come to him. People in Jesus' kingdom live as lights in the darkness. Often when you look at someone who is a Christian, you can't necessarily tell by just looking at them. Oh, that person's a Christian. Oh, that person isn't. But if you watch closely, you will see something different about them. Their heart is different. They have been made righteous by Jesus. And when they do good things, those good things are acceptable to God because the house has been cleaned. You know, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, is a verse that people love to, there's pictures of Jesus standing at the door, knocking as the heart in your garden. And he said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door and invites me and I will come in and we will eat together, we'll fellowship together. When Christ has cleaned us up, we can do that. Of the people in Jesus' kingdom, you can say, as it says in Isaiah 64, verses 8 and 9, they are the clay and God is the potter. Our lives are shaped by God's will and according to what the potter is doing in us. And when we disobey, which we do sometimes, he corrects us and gets us back on course. It says he's not angry beyond measure or be not angry beyond measure with us. There is a measure to his anger. There's a limit. When we have disobeyed, he has to bring us back, to correct us, to bring discipline, to get us back to where we need to be, but only so much as is required. We may still fall from his way, what he wants us to be doing, but if he corrects us and we respond, we come back to him. He disciplines us and brings us back. And as we grow in him, we fail and fall less and less and become stronger in him. Each time we succeed in doing the right thing, we become stronger and better able to resist wrong. Okay, that's act four. Now, act five, what we're hoping for, what we're looking forward to. And that's the passage in Mark that we just read. It describes the final act in this world, act five. It's a time when all of the work will be done. It is the final ending of the strife in this sinful world and the culmination of the righteousness of God. So let's have that back on the wall too. Thank you. It says, but in those days, following that distress, as Act 5 approaches, it will be a time of great distress. The world has already seen a lot of distress, wars, murders, death camps, slavery, starvation, oppression, terrorists. But this will be a time much worse than that, such as a, a time such as the world has never seen before. And when things happen that are talked about in this passage, it will be a time of great terror for people 
but not for all people. Verse 26 tells us that people will see the Son of Man, Jesus, coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Amen. That's good, right? We're looking forward to that. But to anyone who is not a Christian, that will not be a good sight. That will be a sight of terror for them. Someone who, depending on themselves for their salvation, you know, by doing good, or some other religion or some other philosophy, they will see their final doom in the coming of Christ. It will be a time of clarity when people finally realize that this is God. Jesus is God, the only way to salvation. And those who have lived without him will face an eternity without him in terrible suffering. And those who are Christian will look at this time in a very different way. They will see their deliverer coming for them. Verse 27 says, And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Jesus will send his angels to gather all Christians from wherever they are. You might be in a car at that time. You might be in a ship at sea. You might be in an airplane. Or you might be in the shower. But don't worry, you won't miss the party. The angels will come and get you. It will be a time of completion, of finishing the race victoriously. It will be a time of celebration for those who are in Christ. What a contrast between the two reactions, between the two groups of people, those who are in Christ and those who are not. For those who are in Christ, it will be a time of fullness of joy. And for those who are not, it will be a time of overwhelming sorrow. For those in Christ, it will be a time of satisfaction and relief. And for those who are not, it will be a time of depression and despair. Well, that's the end of the story of this world in five acts. The curtain closes on the world. It is the end. But it's also the beginning of the greatest world yet. Listen, it is the dawning of the new earth. It will be a place where people freely worship God and fellowship with him the way that we were made to do it. Like a fish is made for the water, we are made to be in fellowship with God. It will be a place, um, sorry, it won't be marred by anything, not by death, not by suffering or fighting or broken relationships or pain or anything like that. No, it'll be all good. Psalms chapter 16 toward the end says, in God's presence there is fullness of joy at his right hand our pleasures forevermore. Forevermore. Three words stuck together. Forevermore. Forevermore. Let's think about that. What is forevermore? Suppose you had a huge tank, like some of these tanks that the farmers use, they carry around in the back of their trucks or in a trailer, only so big it covered the whole continent of North America. And it's like two miles deep. And you are given the the, the challenge to move all of the water from the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean into that tank using a little cup like this. And then you go over and pour it in. And you go over and pour it in. How long would that take? You know, after a thousand years, you wouldn't even see any difference in the water level. Maybe after a hundred thousand years, it might be down a few feet. And after maybe a hundred million years, you might be nearly finished with emptying the water out of the oceans. That's a long time. Yet in light of eternity, that's only an instant, like snapping your fingers in comparison to eternity. That's how long forevermore is. Forevermore. Ultimately, that is the joy of Christmas. There will be a time when we will have a life so full of good things that we will feel like we might burst from the joy of it, from the happiness of it, and it will never end. All of this Jesus does for us. As, as we take communion together, we are remembering how he gave his life to make all of this possible for us. So we'll move on into our communion time now.
communion table is open to everyone who is a Christian, who knows Christ as their Savior. You're welcome to participate and receive the elements. If you do not, cannot say that at this time in your life you know Christ as your Savior, then, then please pass them by. Um, search your heart now as we get ready to take communion and confess any sins that you might have. This is a time of us drawing close to God. We remember Him and we participate in His death and in His resurrection. I'll lead in a prayer of confession and at the end of that, after a minute or so, I'll leave some time for you to pray silently in your heart if there's anything there that you need to talk to God about. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned. We have sinned against you, your holiness, and your love, and we deserve only your anger and punishment. We sincerely repent. We are genuinely sorry for all the wrongdoing and every failure to do the things we should. Our hearts are grieved, and we acknowledge that we are hopeless without your grace. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, most merciful Father, for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Forgive us, cleanse us, give us strength to serve and please you in newness of life and to honor and praise your name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Each of you take a few minutes now and pray quietly in your heart before the Lord. Now we'll pray for the consecration of the elements, the bread and the juice. Merciful Father, we are following the command of your Son, Jesus Christ as we receive this bread and this cup. As we do this, remembering his suffering and death for us, help us to partake of his body and blood. In the night of his betrayal, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Servers, would you please come forward? We'll pass out the bread now, and as we do, please take a piece if you're participating and hold on to it until all have received, and then we'll partake together.
the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was broken for you. Preserve your soul and body unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed upon him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. We'll now distribute the juice. Please hold on to it until all have received. the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you. Preserve your soul and body unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful.
Thank you, Jesus. You gave your very life for us. No one could take it from you, but you gave it up. You laid it down for us. And in power and glory, you rose again on the third day. And you ascended to heaven and you will come again and take us to be where you are. In that place, your Father's house, with many rooms that you prepared one for each of us. We rejoice in you and we thank you for it. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Great you're here with us today. Appreciate it. Carly out in North Carolina. He'll be home soon. So hang in there, that daughter. Well, and thank you all for being here. Bless your heart. And thanks uh, for all the folks who came out helping uh, decorate. So they worked out. And the rest that didn't come, get to take it down. <laughs> <laughs> Marie, uh, let's we'll sing one more. Uh, 163 is the last hymn that we're going to sing as with uh, gladness men of old. So stand with me and sing hymn number 163 in your hymn. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.